the past 18 years, I've rented out over 700 properties across the UK. Pricey, cheap, massive, tiny. You name it, I've rented it. Along the way, I've had some absolute dream tenants and also had someone call me saying there were ghosts in the walls. But as a result of all this experience, I figured out how to avoid the most common mistakes when renting out a property and I haven't had a truly awful experience for a long time touch word. So regardless of whether you rent one or a thousand properties, here are the top seven lessons that will help you rent your properties faster and more profitably with much less drama along the way. But before we get into the lessons, you might be wondering how I rented out so many properties in the first place. Well, like many other people, I'd saved up some cash from running a business and property was by far the most appealing place to invest in. So I started building my own property portfolio over 15 years ago. And through a combination of enthusiasm and generally being a bit tight, I managed every detail of them myself. Then in 2015, with my business partner, Rob, we started a national letting agency, which by the time we sold it in 2022, was managing over 700 properties. By the way, we do still have a business today that helps cash rich, time poor investors build long-term property portfolios. There's a link to that in the description. But anyway, during those very testing years, we experienced every type of tenant you could imagine. So from that experience of managing 700 lettings, what are the biggest lessons that I took away that you can start using today? A few months ago, a tenant moved out of one of my flats. So we advertised for new tenants to move in. Every time we'd done this previously, it had found a new occupant in a matter of days. So I was confused when I got an update two weeks after the advert went live, saying that there hadn't been any interest at all. So I went on to Rightmove to check out the competition and immediately saw what the problem was. Two other similar flats nearby were also being marketed for rent and the rent was 50 pounds per month less. Clearly, this is why the phone hadn't been ringing. Pretty much everyone is going to be sorting by price. And if they see two options that are almost identical, but one is cheaper, which one do you think is gonna be getting the call? I instructed the letting agent to reduce the rent to match. And lo and behold, two days later, a perfect tenant had been found. For all the stories you'll read about greedy landlords charging as much as they feel like, in reality, the market is extremely price sensitive. I often say that landlords don't set rents, the market sets rents. If you don't believe me, advertise something for £50 more than the market norm, like I did, then sit back and listen to the crickets. This is a really easy mistake to avoid if you just do two things. First, before putting a property on the market, adopt the mindset of a tenant, go on to Rightmove and Zoopla and do a search yourself to make sure you're pitching the price in line with your competition. If you're in a popular area and there are exact comparables, this is dead easy. If not, you'll have to use a bit of guesswork and review the interest you've had over the course of a week. Something we found while running an agency is that if the phone isn't ringing within the first week, nothing is magically gonna happen in week two that changes that. Whether it's the price that's wrong or photos or something else, fix it quickly because waiting isn't gonna do you any favors. But of course, once you've got interest, that's just the start and finding a tenant can be massively time consuming. In my early years, I spent more than my fair share of time fielding inquiries, arranging a time for a viewing and battling through traffic to get to the property. Then a discouraging proportion of the time, the potential tenant either didn't turn up at all or spent two minutes looking around and clearly couldn't have been less interested. It's a process that can easily suck up hours and hours of your time. But then I discovered a ridiculously simple and effective solution. Arrange just one or two viewing times to suit me and tell everyone to come at those times. This block viewing approach has the obvious benefit of saving you a load of travel time, but the real magic of it is that it gets psychology working in your favor. When viewers see other people looking around at the same time, or maybe they catch someone leaving just as they arrive, it makes them extremely aware that there is competition. FOMO mode is activated and you're far more likely to have them apply. Importantly, it also puts you in a position of abundance so you don't feel the pressure to say yes to an offer when you've got niggling doubts. On one block viewing I did, I had someone say they wanted to take it there and then, but for some reason I had my doubts about whether they were the right person. Because I had so much interest, I held off. And later that evening, I had an offer from someone who seemed to be absolutely perfect. Six years later, they're still living there and they're the best tenants I've ever had. Both personally and at the agency, block viewings were our most powerful tool for getting properties let to the right person quickly. And getting the right person is extremely important, not just for you and your time, but for your property as well. If you want to blow your mind with how some people choose to live, start a letting agency. Some of the photos you'll see on checkout reports are just beyond belief. I've rented a property to a couple who were only there for six months, but in that time, somehow managed to turn a newly decorated flat into an absolute biohazard 
that cost thousands to put right. I've also rented to tenants who paid the rent for years, but when they moved out, I wasn't convinced they'd ever lived there at all because it was so spotless. The difference in how well people will treat a property is astonishing. And there's limited correlation with demographics or socioeconomic status, with obvious exceptions like the fact that students are less likely to use coasters than the general population. I personally haven't done this and just take my chances, but the best thing you can do is visit potential tenants in the home they live in now. Even if they have a bit of a tidy up first, you can get a good sense of what their level of cleanliness is. But even once you have someone who seems like the dream applicant, it can quickly turn into a nightmare. And in our Sunday Times column, we often hear from landlords who've had dreadful experiences with tenants. Some of them have just been unlucky, but many times it turns out that through trust or naivety, they never undertook reference checks before the tenant moved. In. You can order reference checks for £20 per tenant or even less and it will reveal their credit history, whether they have any CCJs against them, check that they're actually employed and earning what they claim to earn, and if possible, get a reference from their previous landlord. And if you let everyone know about the referencing up front, people who know they'd probably fail won't apply which will also save you time. But referencing will only get you so far. For a start, circumstances change. Someone could lose their job the day after they move in and there's not a lot you can do about it. And unless you've got a particularly honest previous landlord, they're unlikely to tell you if their rent was consistently late or if they turned the place into a tip, especially if they're still living in that previous landlord's property and they want rid of them. But it is a basic first layer of defense that you should never scrimp on. And one thing that will help you with the process of making sure your letting is legal and set up for success is our lettings checklist, which you can download in the description. But if you're ever tempted to skip referencing for any reason, this story will change that forever. I had a property that was not in the best area and had historically been a bit tricky to rent. So when it became available and I had an applicant who offered six months rent up front, I was delighted. I had loads going on and I couldn't really focus on searching for the perfect tenant or conducting a bunch of checks. So this seemed perfect. And it's true that for six months, my problem was solved. I received all the money up front and she quietly lived there until inevitably it was time to discuss whether she wanted to move out, pay another six months up front or go through reference and start paying monthly. Well, it turned out she wasn't keen on any of those options. She wanted to continue living there without paying any rent at all. Five months, one bailiff visit, and a few thousand pounds of missed rent later, she finally moved out. And as I later learned, if I'd bothered to make reference checks, I would have discovered a string of CTJs linked to previous addresses. This is the type of mistake you only make once, but hopefully you now won't need to make it at all. Even if there is a good reason to accept rent upfront, and there can be, that's not a reason to skip referencing. But even if you have tenants who are paying bang on time, that doesn't necessarily mean you're in for an easy ride. Because the thing about lettings is you're dealing with people and you quickly come to understand that people are absolutely bloody nuts. No offense. I've repressed most of the stories I heard from our team, but I do remember the tenant who moved out taking all his possessions except a giant tropical fish tank, fish included, and the tenant of mine who called up saying she had to move out immediately because the walls were haunted. When you're renting out a property, you're not only dealing with people, who are, again, nuts. You're dealing with people at a time of high stress in relation to something that's extremely important to them. So strange things will happen and you will need to occasionally be a counselor, therapist, and parent as well as a landlord. Some landlords I know actively enjoy being involved and having a relationship with their tenants. But if that's not you, that's fine. It wasn't me either. And that's why you use a letting agent. Choosing the right agent is critical and you'll still have work to do staying on top of them. But being one step removed from the weirder and more emotional aspects of lettings may be the best way for you to retain your faith in humanity. However, you do want to be slightly careful about how removed you and your team are. Because when I started our letting agency, I was coming from a technical background. I'd seen how inefficient other agents were. And I was convinced that with the right systems and processes, we could turn the whole operation into a well-oiled machine. What I'd missed though is exactly what I've just been talking about. Letting out property is all about people. People do weird and unexpected things and everyone's situation and circumstances are different. So while systems are a helpful add-on, the human touch is everything. The best members of our team weren't those who knew all the keyboard shortcuts or could spot the inefficiency in a process. They were the ones who could build rapport and master that tricky art of being understanding and sympathetic without being taken advantage of. But one thing that should always be systemized is the way in which you set up a tenancy to ensure that everything is above board. Otherwise, you can end up paying hefty fines. So download our legal lettings checklist from the link in the description. And if you also want a system to work out a good deal from a bad one, so you can say with absolute certainty if a property is worth investing in, check out this video here.